Hallelujah. How many know that God has been good? How many know that God has been good? Come on, y'all help me worship God today. There are so many places closed down, but we want to worship God today. We didn't come to play with him today. We came out despite what is going on in the world. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus. 
How many know that God has been good? Has not God been great? You ought to tell God, thank you, because God, you're worthy to be praised. Somebody ought to tell the Lord, thank you. You've been better to me than I've been to my own self. And for that, I want to worship you. For that, I want to call upon your name. For that, I want to give you the glory. Come on, somebody. Pleasant parishioners, help me worship God. If you're a pleasant parishioner or a partner of Pleasant Green, you ought to tell God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How great God is. How great God is. We're thankful. We're thankful. We're thankful. We're thankful today because God still reigns. Brothers and sisters, I want us to be careful. I want us to be cautious. I want us to be practical. And brothers and sisters, I don't want you to leave this place um, being condescending to any other church who's decided to close their doors. Because of the fact of the matter is, they're doing what's best for their particular congregation. So we don't want you to leave this place saying that uh, y'all closed, but we still opened our doors. We have a different context. And God has given me a different revelation from wherever or other churches, brothers and sisters. And brothers and sisters, we're thankful for this opportunity to serve. So therefore, what I'm sharing with you is to be careful, to be cautious. Um, I want you to be practical. In other words, being practical means wash your hands. Wash your hands, wash your hands. And after you're careful, after you're cautious, after you're practical, brothers and sisters, as people of God, we've got to be prayerful. We've got to be prayerful. If we can stand on the Word of God and stand on the shoulders of those who have gone on before us, um, many seasoned saints used to say prayer changes things. And I want us to be faithful in realizing that prayer changes things. Prayer can keep you protected. Uh, prayer can give you provision. And brothers and sisters, prayer also gives us the wisdom to be practical. Amen? We won't be before you long today. I just think that there is a word from God. Uh, to the pleasant parishioners of PGMBC and our partners. With that being said, if you will go with me to 1 Kings, uh, we'll read seventh, uh, in the 17th chapter, uh, we'll read verses 7 through 14. We'll read these very quickly um, so that we can hear from the Word of God uh, and then after we leave, we can abide by the word of God. First Kings, 17th chapter, the 7th uh, through the 14th verses, and it reads like this. It reads like this in the New International Version rendering. It says, sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, says, Go to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food, toilet tissue. No, it, it don't say that. It, it don't say that. So when he went to Zarephath, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks and called to her, he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may drink? And she answered him, said, um, uh, as she was going to get it, she said, I, uh, well, he, he said to her, And bring me a little piece of bread. And she responded by saying, As surely as the Lord thy God liveth, 
Uh, I don't have any bread, but I just have a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for me and my son so that we might eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do what you said you was going to do. But first, put a little small loaf of bread in my hand uh, and then make for you and your son. Uh, this is the last verse. It says, for this is what the Lord God of Israel says. For the jar of flour will not fail, uh, nor the jug of oil run out or run dry until the day the Lord sends rain upon the land. God bless you, brothers and sisters. And I just want to use, in this time of crises, um, I want to use as a framework for this particular pericope, maintaining faith in a desolate place. Maintaining faith in a desolate place. Why don't you tell your neighbor, don't touch your neighbor, don't, unless you want to get fired on. And why don't you tell your neighbor, maintain faith, even though you experience a desolate place. Brothers and sisters, when we look at this particular text, we understand a few things. Uh, in this initial saga of Elijah, we see that his history begins somewhat abruptly. This particular text, it starts out talking about Elijah, and not only does it start out talking about Elijah, it talks about brothers and sisters in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. The very, very first verse prompts us to who he was, his mission, and the completion of his first task. Elijah's story begins with him telling an unrighteous king that there will be a famine in the land of Israel. However, my Christian friends, after the first verse, the plot of the story seems to take a different direction. It seems as if the writer or the author of this chapter wanted to direct our attention toward another detail. It is another detail in the text that sometimes the author tries to get the people of God to see. The second verse says, and the word of God came unto him saying, get thee hence, turn eastward and hide thyself beside the brook uh, that is called Cherith. My brothers and sisters, uh, if you would understand that this text is littered with divine details, and I'll try to get to all of these details so that we can be gone. Brothers and sisters, first of all, a divine detail in this text is that the word Sometimes when the word of the Lord comes to you, you have to be urgent about what the word of God tells you to do. In other words, brothers and sisters, when the word of God comes to you, you've got to make a move. You got to do what the word of God tells you quick, fast, and in a hurry. You've got to be urgent about doing what God told you to do when God told you to do it. Not only does God tell Elijah to move, but the Lord gave him specific directions. It says in the text, it says, turn eastward, hide thyself by the brook Cherith uh, that is before Jordan. Brothers and sisters, God gives those who listen to God specific orders. If God call you to it, God gives you directions to do it. God pulls Elijah out of the place, out of the palaces, 
out the, I, I, he pulls Elijah out of the palace. He pulls him out of those places that he is familiar with. He pulls him out of the palace and places him beside a pond. He takes him from out of the strongholds and steers him to a stream. He moves Elijah out of the king's castle and commands him to sit there by a creek. He removes Elijah out of the surge and leads him beside the still. Well, I wish I had just a few praying pleasant parishioners in the house in here today to understand that sometimes God will move you from that is familiar to place you in a position to where you want to exercise your faith. And I want to suggest to you today again that sometimes God moves you away from what you are used to so that God can get out of you what God needs from you. Come on, talk to me in here, pleasant parishioners. And the story continues to go, brothers and sisters, that it does not begin until Elijah is out of the presence of the palace, out of the custody of King Ahab. He's hiding beside a brook with a few bags of toilet paper, brothers and sisters, where he is forced to exercise, implement, and apply, and exercise his faith in God. Therefore, the text deduces that from time to time, God seeks to remove you from your comfort zone in order to use you for God's purpose. I wish I had some help in here. God has to remove you from your security blanket to help you remember that God and God alone is our refuge and God is our strength. God is our present help in the time of coronavirus. I wish I had some help in here. Sometimes the Lord has to take us to strange places. Sometimes God has to take us to some unfamiliar and uncomfortable comfortable situation, some unnerving job. Sometimes God has to take us to unfamiliar territories in life to show us that it is God and God only who sustains us. It is God who lifts us. It is God who carries us over. It is God who takes us through. It is God who provides for us. It is God who gives us provision in the midst of mess. It is God who still keeps you breathing in an atmosphere where you gotta put a mask on. It is God that does the work for you. And brothers and sisters, as believers in God, we ought to give God thanks because God is keeping us when we can't keep ourselves. Verse 6. Verse 6 says the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread in the meat in the evening. Brothers and sisters, now we've got to understand the nature of ravens. I wish that you would walk with me through biology class. Brothers and sisters, now a raven is a bird who is known to be a scavenger. A raven is a bird that is known to be an opportunity, an opportunist. Brothers and sisters, a raven and a crow, they share the same chromosomes, brothers and sisters. And what we must understand about about ravens, they were made to take away and they were not made to bring stuff to you. I wish I had some help in here, but I thank God that God is able to change the DNA of being so that that same being that was made to take stuff away from the children of God, God changed this DNA so that he was made to bring stuff to you. I'm preaching. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I did a little more research, brothers and sisters. And when I looked at ravens, I looked at crows, I looked at that there is a certain virus that comes from ravens and there is a certain virus that comes from crows. I wish I had some help in here. 
if you look in uh, the history books uh, uh, of our uh, American society, you will see that in 2006, there was a virus that came from crows. And brothers and sisters, there's also a virus that came from ravens. But what I'm standing here before the pleasant parishioners on this day to say that sometimes God uses viruses to place virtue back into the people of God. Sometimes God uses these as opportunities for the people of God to get back in front of his face and to lift up our hands and to walk before God in spirit and truth. Sometimes God uses these opportunities. Therefore, we see, brothers and sisters, it is out of character for a raven to feed a human. Because if we look in the streets, we see ravens, we see crows. Brothers and sisters, they don't come to bring bread, but when they land in the street, they come to take bread away. But somebody said that my God is able to supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. In other words, God can change the nature of a situation for those who love the Lord. I wish I had just one more person who love the Lord in here today. In other words, you can understand that if a man's ways please the Lord, he can make even his enemies. Y'all don't believe me. David discovered that brothers and sisters that God can take an enemy and turn an enemy into a footstool. The seasoned saints would say that God can do, God specializes in things impossible. And he can do with no other power except Holy Ghost power can do. And I need you to know that sometimes God causes oasises in unlikely places. God seeks to bless you when it seems like blessing is not in order. You all remember in Genesis, don't you? I'm about to lose my voice, but I'm going to preach as much as I can. You all remember in Genesis, don't you? While Jacob was alone, God still blessed him. Come on. Here today, he wrestled with him, and he wrestled him with him, and he wrestled him with him in such a way that he said that I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the Lord blessed him there. Y'all walk with me. You all remember in the New Testament, don't you? Paul was on the Damascus Road. And brothers and sisters, while Paul was on the Damascus Road, what the text says is that a light shone round about him and he became blind. But the blessing about the text is that when he became blind, God chose his blindness to enlighten him. Talk to me, somebody. On the edge of a poroth cliff, nowhere to go but down 7,234 feet down into the Arabian Gulf. The Lord still showed up on Moses, and he showed up in such a way that they didn't have nowhere to go. They didn't have nowhere to escape, but God showed up, and he made a way out of no way. He showed up, brothers and sisters, and he split the Red Sea. He allowed him to go from Peroth to the land of God. I wish I had somebody in here that knows that God sees about his children. And I don't care. I don't care. I don't care, brothers and sisters. I don't care how much your circumstances may heat up. I want you to know that God can show up to cool you down. Amen. I'm going to keep going today. I'm going to keep going even with no voice. 
God can show up in a hot situation and he can cool you down. in a hot situation, and he can cool you down. Somebody said, well, Reverend Letcher, that's not in the text. Yes, it is. Let's go to the third chapter of Daniel. You all remember when there was a hot situation going, don't you? That was a hot situation. The, the governors told everybody, you got to kneel down to our God. And if you don't kneel down to our God, we're going to throw you into the fiery furnace. There were three boys that said, we're not going to kneel to your God. I wish I had some help in here. They didn't kneel to that God, and they kept on praising the Lord. And in praising the Lord, they said, I'm going to throw you into a hot situation. I wish I had some help in here. And when they were thrown into a hot situation, they still trusted in God. And when they trusted in God, it was a fourth man that showed up. I wish I had some help in here. The enemy said there was three men that were showed in the throat in the fiery furnace, but there's a fourth man now, and the fourth man looks like the son of man. All I'm trying to tell you is that when you find yourself in a hot situation, God will show up. God will cool you down. I'm done. You all remember, you all remember the thief that was hanging on the cross. He lived his life, his entire life as a sinner. He was hanging on the cross, but one day he met a man named Jesus. And he recognized the divinity of Jesus Christ. And he told the other sinner, he said, no, wait a minute, we've lived our lives as sinners. But this man has done no wrong. Jesus paused from dying. He lifted up his head and he noticed and recognized a child of his. And he said, this day, I wish I had some saints in here that know that God can visit you even on this day. God can visit you even when you feel like that there is no way God can visit you. Even though you feel like your situation is dead, God can visit you. I'm almost out of here. Brothers and sisters, this text seeks to teach us that when we meet up with the uncertainties of life, when we encounter life's inclement weather, when your voice cracks or when the coronavirus is in verity, brothers and sisters, when we struggle with the troubles of life, brothers and sisters, we've got to understand that we've got to walk by faith. <laughs> got to walk by faith. Walk by faith. Why don't you tell your neighbor, why don't you go ahead and walk by faith. And when you walk by faith, you serve as a demonstration to other folks. I know I moved from the volunteer state, now I'm in the show me state. So brothers and sisters, I pray that it is our spiritual testimony that we are able to show other folks the way to Christ by the way we talk. That we can show other folks to the way to Christ by the way we give. We can show other folks the way of Christ by the way we engage those who we don't feel like are as important as us. If we look at the text, we discover that even Elijah, I want you to understand this also in life, sometimes you have to make some detours. 
You know, life does not always go how you plan it to go. I learned that a long time ago, that life, I would say 50% of the time, don't go as we plan it to go. Even if you look at scripture in Proverbs 16, it says that we can plan, but God will give us the way. Sometime later, if you look, I guess y'all will wait for me to correlate that to the text. If you look at the text, after all that Elijah had done, he was faithful to God. He walked in God's principles. He did what God told him to do. He went to the brook that was called Cherith. But even when he went to the brook, what the text says is that the brook dried. Come on, where my scholars are. The brook dried up. So what I'm trying to tell you, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, don't ever get too comfortable in your brook because your brook has a potential to dry up. Don't get too comfortable with where you are because your brook has a possibility, a capability to dry up. But you've got to trust in the Lord. Elijah's essential source of life, but yet even after following God's command, the brook dries up. We must remember that although we serve a sovereign Savior, although we work uh, for the wonder worker, although our devotion is for the divine deliverer, we must bear in mind that there is no guarantee against the dehydrating droughts of life. Our brooks can dry up. I don't know what your brook is. Maybe your brook is your fine wife. Your brook can dry up. Maybe your brook is your friendship with others. Your brook can dry up. Maybe somebody is relying upon their finances. Your brook can dry up. Brothers and sisters, whatever your brook is, if it is not God, it can dry up. But what blesses me about the text is that the same God that told Elijah to go to the brook is the same God that kept him when the brook dried up. Simply means that God in life sometimes has another mission, another obligation, and another place for you to go. God has better provisions for you. God has perhaps better relationships for you. God perhaps has better ministries for you. God has a bigger smile for you to experience. And it was simply, and it was simply, brothers and sisters, it served as a reminder for us to trust God and not trust our brook. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, when I think a situation is down, he says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that is within us. God was not finished with Elijah. Because when the brook dried up, when the brook, brook fell, God told Elijah to go to the Phoenician city called Zarephath. Brothers and sisters, if we perhaps don't realize what Zarephath means, Zarephath means a place of refining. 
Sometimes God will send you to unexpected places because God seeks to refine you. And after God refines you, God desires to bless you. The text illustrates a hungry, hammered, homeless hero as he encounters a widow, and not by coincidence, not by happenstance, not by accidents, not by chance or a stroke of luck, this widow was in the process of preparing her and her son's last meal. And as we look closely, carefully, and cautiously at the text and at the actions of Elijah, I saw that he made a demanding requisition upon the widow woman. Elijah asked her to bring him the last piece of bread. The text says, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in the vessel that I may drink. And then he says, then do for you and your son. Brothers and sisters, he tests her faith. Because many folks wouldn't give to the man of God before they would give to their child. <laughs> but he tests their faith. He tests her faith. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, what I suggest to you is that God pushes you to a place and a position so that you would be forced to exercise your faith. He says to her, and I'm done, y'all. He says, as the Lord my God liveth, he says, when you do what God has told you to do, as the Lord my God liveth, he says, the barrel in the meal won't fail, nor the oil in the cruise, until God sends rain on the land. And one of the things I want to leave you with is that when you do what God told you to do, God will take care of you. When you do what God has commanded and asked for you to do, God will care for you. God will take care of you. The door of the church is open. This time, brothers and sisters, we're moving into a mo another mode of worship. Uh, and we have to understand that as believers, uh, that brothers and sisters, uh, as disciples of Jesus Christ, God calls for us to give. I want you to understand this. You can give without being a disciple but you cannot be a disciple without giving. We want to pray as we enter this mode of worship. We want to pray, God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your presence, and we thank you for your power. We thank you for your provision. Help us to understand uh, that giving is priority. God, help us to understand that giving should be done proportionately. Lord God, help us to understand that giving is to be done sacrificially and that giving is to be done cheerfully. Help us to understand the tithe is what we owe. It is a standard that we set. It is the basement of giving. And then God, help us to understand that the offering that we give according to your word is a seed that we sow. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let this teaching leak into the lives of your pleasant parishioners. And not only leak into their lives, leak into their hearts. So that as it leaks into their hearts, it can leak into their pockets. 
because we understand that if we give our lives to you, we'll give everything else we are to you. We'll give our hearts, we'll give our beings, and we'll give what we have. In Jesus' name, let us worship God cheerfully through giving. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceedingly joy, the God that is able to keep you from all manner of sickness and disease, including the coronavirus. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for keeping us, and we thank you for your presence, and we thank you for your provision, and we thank you for your power. And we, we present ourselves to you so that, God, that we can be an offering that is acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Now unto him, Forever, forever and forever, may we all say, Amen. Ah.